Let's talk about the Bible six seal. Sorry, little guy. Maybe next time. Hello, you wonderful sons and daughters of God, my brothers and sisters. You have probably heard some claiming we are in the seventh seal here in the 2020s. You may have heard we are in the seven years of tribulation or Christ will return in power and glory in the mid 2020s or 2033. From what I've seen, their intentions are admirable. It's very obvious. They've put much prayer, thought, and effort in on the topic. Many of the videos have great insights, and their presentations have also had many views, which is a good thing. You know, it's a good sign to see so many people interested in the topic. We need that. Yet, are all the connections they made correct? Or are some of the connections false? Do some of those connections compress or distort the order of events? Are they leaving out key foundational scriptures about the prophetic events of our day? Have they misinterpreted those key fundamental scriptures about the prophetic of our day? Well, we're gonna take a look here. Keep a prayer in your heart. And this is a great time to have a feast. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at the scriptures used and connections made and see if you agree that although what they said sounded convincing in reality regarding some key points, they didn't hit the target. They did hit the audience. They got a lot of views. Yeah, but otherwise they shared some great insights too. So we begin with the six seal event. And what I wanna do is I just wanna take a look here at the six seal event. And, um, and with the six seal event, before we jump into that, what I wanna do is I want to show you something here. Uh, some people claim that the six seal event is regarding uh, this uh, earthquake that happened back in uh, 1202 AD. So it's easy to Google. You just Google it and you'll it'll come right up and you can uh, take a look at that there. So what we want to find out is, is it something that happened back in 1202 AD or is it something to come in the future? Now that earthquake uh, in 1202 AD, it killed like 1.1 million people but so it, it was big, but yeah, let's go ahead and look at the scriptures and see what they say and see what you think about it. We're going to begin in chapter six of Revelation and we're going to begin with verse 12. So over here at verse 12, it says, and when I had opened up the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as half cloth of hair and the moon became red as blood. What caused the earthquake? We get the answer in the next verse. And the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Well, we're talking about asteroids or meteorites or something that by the hundreds are going to impact earth so violently. Well, let's take a look at the next verse on this. Verse 19, and the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. This is the worst catastrophic event since the flood of Noah's time. And because we are talking about one or more objects coming our way, our powerful telescopes have already detected it or soon will. We will know years in advance. What will we do to protect ourselves? Look at verse 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. You see, we know in advance we find shelter. Look what most of the world thinks about this event. And said unto the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And from the wrath of the lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Many think this is the return of Christ in power and glory. And I'm going to show you something over in the Doctrine and Covenants about it. Yet it isn't. This is a six silly event. We have a ways to go. Now, Revelation chapter 7 is a continuation of the six silly event. Over here in Revelation chapter 7, um, it's talking about the wind is going to stop blowing. We don't know the full effect of it. But here's what it reads. 
And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four winds of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth, and he saying, and the, and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, so there's not going to be any wind, it looks like, after this earthquake that moves every mountain island out of their places. So, and the 144,000, they, uh, they get sealed after that uh, event. So let's take a look at uh, something that Joseph Smith said. This is shortly before his death. I attended a prayer meeting with the quorum in the assembly room and made some remarks respecting the 144,000 mentioned by John the Revelator, showing that the selection of persons to form that number had already commenced. Wow, it already commenced back in Joseph Smith's day. Now, he didn't say that it was complete, but you can see that it wasn't having anything to do with a 1,202 AD type of earthquake event, right? It's not dealing with that there. Now, let's go ahead and look at DNC section 88. If you want, you can pause the clip right now, take a look at it at this section here. Section 88 is about Joseph's time, to our time, and the future for over a thousand years. And did you see any indication of it refer referencing something that happened around 1202 AD? I didn't. Yet what I did see is that in verse 81, it says, Behold, I sent you out to testify and to warn the people, and it becometh every man who hath been warned to warn his neighbor. Why? Look at verse 82. Therefore they are left without excuse, and their sins are upon their own heads. And here's a great blessing, 83. And he that seeketh me early shall find me, and shall not be forsaken. Now, look at this here, the action one. Therefore tarry ye, and labor diligently, that you may be perfected in your ministry, and go forth among the Gentiles for the last time, as many as the mouth of the Lord shall name, to bind up the law and seal up the testimony and to prepare the saints for the hour of judgment which is to come. So what is this about? Converting Gentiles to saints and preparing the saints. Let's keep the last words in mind. For the hour of the judgment is to come. Why? What's to come? Let's read on and see uh, what's so important here to warn our neighbors. And uh, is it to warn our neighbors about an earthquake that happened back in 1202 AD? Obviously not. Verse 85 clearly indicates that this is an event is about our day. And about, uh, so let's go ahead and take a look. That their souls may escape the wrath of God, the desolation of abomination, which will wait at the wicked, both in this world and in the world to come. Verily I say unto you, let those who are not first of the first elders continue in the vineyard until the mouth of the Lord shall call them, for their time is not yet come. Their garments are not yet clean of this generation. Now look at the next several verses. Verse 86, Abide in the liberty wherewith ye are made free. Entangle not yourself in sin, but let your hands be clean until the Lord comes. For not many days hence, and the earth shall tr tremble to and fro as a drunken man, and the sun shall hide his face, and shall refuse to give light, and the moon shall be bathed in blood, and the stars shall become exceedingly angry, and shall cast themselves down as a fig that falleth off the fig tree. And after your testimony cometh wrath and indignation upon the people. For after your testimony cometh the testimony of 
earthquakes yeah. that shall cause groaning in the midst of her and men's heart. Men shall fall upon the ground and shall not be able to stand. And also cometh the testimony of the voice of thundering and the voice of lightning and the voice of tempest and the voice of waves of seas of the sea heaving themselves beyond their bounds. And all things shall be in commotion and surely men's heart shall fail them where the fear shall come upon all people and angels shall fly through the midst of heaven crying with a loud voice sounding the trump of god saying prepare ye prepare ye o inhabitants of the earth for the judgment of our god is come behold the uh, the bridegroom cometh go ye out to meet him i want to just have you take a look at this real quick here. so over here in revelation chapter 6 we read about the earthquake over here and, and we read about the people, everybody goes and hides themselves in dens and rocks of the mountains and everything. And what do they say? They said, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, who shall be able to stand? Why are they thinking that this is a return of Christ in power and glory? is because in section 87, 88, we read that the angels are going to be flying through the midst of heaven, crying with a loud voice, sounding the trump of God, saying, Prepare ye, prepare ye, O inhabitants of the earth, for the judgment of our God has come. And behold, and lo, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out and meet him. Isn't that a fascinating connection between the book of Revelation book you know, and the Doctrine and Covenants? We can see why the people think that is the return of Christ. The angels are out there saying it. Okay, so now what I want to do, I want you to just think about what do you think? Do you think that this is referring to an event in 1202 AD or something in the future? Let's look at verse 87 again, the uh, beginning of it. For not many days hence. From what I can tell, it looks like this six seal event is going to happen between about 2029 to 2032, somewhere around there. And what does that mean? That means that this is going to be something that if NASA and the powerful people that and the people that are running these powerful uh, telescopes, if they don't know that these, this object or objects is heading our way right now, they're going to know it here in the next few years. Now, what I want you to do is, uh, is I want you to take a look over at a website. This website is called Bible Signs Happening, right over to the home page, right here. So this is the home page right over here. And if you click on Discoveries right here, and then if you go right down here to LDS References and just click on that, then you'll see that there's some videos over here. And uh, this one here, right on uh, DNC 88, and about uh, building up Zion. If you click on that one there, you'll see that there's a nice clip. It's a really, really uplifting clip. So you want to check that out. And great information on uh, what we've been talking about. It goes more in depth on it. and But it has a very, very, it's a fantastic ending. Very uplifting. So you really want to be able to check that out. Now, shifting gears to another point. For hundreds of years, it's been thought and taught that Daniel chapter 11 is about ancient times, like King Alexander the Great. Well, however, as some of you may know, I have had two DVDs in some Deseret bookstores back in around 2011 on this topic and also on DNC 88. I had discovered that both John in the book of Revelation and Daniel in the book of Daniel, that they and the angels who spoke to them indicated that there will be a succession of eight kings leading up to the return of Christ in power and glory. Major, major discovery. And I know this is new for most of you. However, I feel that there is now enough compelling evidence that many will start catching on to it now. And over the next few years, the compelling evidence it will just grow tremendously. So is the traditional interpretation about Daniel chapter 11 correct? Well, look at the heading of Daniel chapter 11. 
Daniel sees the successive kings and their wars, leagues, and conflicts that lead up to the second coming of Christ. Would that seem to indicate a stretch of time of about 2,500 years? So I diagrammed out Daniel chapter 11 here on this chart and uh, right over here. So this is all about Daniel chapter 11. And it talks about a, there's a lot of kings that it mentions over here and over here. But within the many kings is a succession of eight kings right here. And uh, now, can these eight kings span from 530 BC to the return of Christ in power and glory? No, of course not. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the first 11 verses of Daniel chapter 11 and uh, see if it indicates uh, one after another after another or what. So we begin with verse one. It says, now this is an angel talking to Daniel. Also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to uh, confirm and strengthen him. And now I will shew thee the, tree, the truth. Uh, behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength and through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king shall stand up, which shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and, and shall be divided towards the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. And the king of the south shall be strong and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and he and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And in the end of years, they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but, he, but she shall be given up and they that brought her and he that begat her and he that strengthened her in these times. But out of the branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail. And shall also carry captive into Egypt their gods, with their princes, and their precious vessels of silver and gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south shall come into his own kingdom and shall return to his own land. But his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces. And one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. And then shall he return and be stirred up even to his own fortress. And the king of the south shall be moved with choler and shall come forth and fight with him, even the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. Did you pick up on any major time gaps? Well, those 11 verses touch on these eight kings over here. Well, six of the kings right here, right here. These six kings right there. And then two kings over here on the kingdom of the south. Uh, these kings over here. Well, as you can see, there's only two more kings left before the return of Christ in power and glory. And one of them only lives for a few days. And uh, so does it seem possible? Now, I want to know which king is in power. What is his name? Where is he? Which king are we on? The first one or which one of the eight? So here's the thing that you can do is that if you go over to Bible Science Happening, over at BibleScienceHappening.com, uh, just click on Discoveries and it'll take you over to this page here. And then you can watch clips on Revelation chapter 17 and then 18 and then Daniel chapter 11 and then 8 and then 7. And these, Daniel 11, 8 and 7 are foundational chapters out of all the Bible, out of all the scriptures to date for organizing the prophetic events of our day in general order. 
those are the chapters I cover in the in the first two DVDs that were over at the Desera bookstores back in 2011. A big difference is, is that since 2011, there's been events that have happened and there's been prophetic people in the Bible that have been identified. And so you got to watch these clips. It's amazing. Now look for at the past 400 years of what the pastors and Bible scholars have thought and taught about Daniel chapter 11. Look at this short clips I made years ago that goes over the common errors of just the first 10 verses. I share a lot of points very quickly. You may need to watch it twice. What we have read is a story about a succession of kings leading up to the return of Christ. If we are anywhere close to the return of Christ, then one of those kings is alive and ruling today. However, as you will see from th this example by Ed Milhausen, he does not accept the fact that there is plainly an unbroken succession of kings leading up to the return of Christ. Ed does do a good job of explaining his information here on his website. Ed's good job of being articulate really helps us to see the obvious differences. With that being said, we'll, we've read the first 10 verses of Daniel chapter 11. There was no major gaps from verses 2 through 10. Uh, there are a succession of uh, these four kings. The fourth king is, is rich and powerful and mighty, and when he shall stand up, he shall be broken, and his kingdom will not go to his posterity. His kingdom will be divided into at least a kingdom, kingdom of the north and a kingdom of the south. When the king of the north dies, his son takes over. Years later, when that son vanishes, then a riser attacks this person, becomes the king for a few days, and then at that time he is killed by a vile person who later on is then killed when Christ returns. Yet Ad Ed thinks that the first king in verse 2 is a king back around 530 BC. Daniel says these kings are from Persia. Yeah, which today is Iran. Yet Ed thinks this mighty king is Alexander the Great, who's from Greece, which wasn't a king until over a hundred years later after the fourth king had died. Do you see over a hundred year gap between verse 2 and verse 3? Or verse 2 and verse 4? I don't. Ed then writes about this kingdom of the north and uh, in the kingdom of, of the south as being two of the four generals who took over when Alexander the Great died. However, Ed writes that the two kings at the end of years are not those two kings. They are sons of those two kings who actually do make an agreement. But Daniel makes it clear to me that the agreement is not successful. Daniel wrote, and in the end of years they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the kingdom of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. Even if we wanted to believe what Ed said is true, then there would have only been an unbroken succession of three more kings before Christ would have returned in power and glory. Christ would have returned in power and glory before he was even born. Add in the Bible scholars and pastors and other church leaders who have taught this type of interpretation where the first three kings begin back around 530 BC, they are obviously and clearly wrong. Now it's time to focus our attention on what the right interpretation is. Wow! 
talking about cherry picking historic events to try and get them to match up with scriptures, this is a classic example, and it is widespread around the world. Yet, when you watch just the first five clips over at BibleScienceHappening.com under the Discovery tab, you are going to see why more and more people are agreeing. The succession of eight kings is about our day, and we know who he is and where he is and what prophetically he has fulfilled and is fulfilling and what happens next. So get over to BibleScienceHappening.com and get up to speed about these amazing discoveries and insights and learn about the foundational chapters, Daniel chapter 11, 8, and 7. And then start to organize the other prophetic events on that firm foundation. It will be a great help for you in so many ways, including helping you to detect when people are taking scriptures out of context regarding the prophetic events of our day. Also knowing the general order to, of the key prophetic events and how they play out. Clues also about how far away the return of Christ is in power and glory. Where better areas might be to live and where bad areas to live might be. So, and so much more. And get the prophetic playbook story. The prophetic playbook story is a book that goes over the prophetic events in, over the next 30 years or so. It's a fantastic read. It's only about 200 pages long, and yet there's over 50 huge, major, astonishing, and or significant Bible insights discovered over there. And what this is all about, this is about helping us draw closer to Christ to Heavenly Father and the Holy Ghost. And it's ab about helping other people to grow closer to them too. And this is a fantastic opportunity for us to prepare and to help others who are not prepared. And here's the other thing, is that what you'll find in the book and in the videos is that there's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna have a bright future. And I want you, your family, your loved ones, to be among them. And together, I want us to help gather other people to do that wonderful, bright future too. So get on over there to BibleScienceHappening.com. Take a look over there and uh, watch those clips, get that book, and God bless.